All right, now in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I want to focus on the beginning part of that chapter where he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. That very first verse, he mentions a few things. He says, supplications, prayers, intercessions. We ought to be, what I'm going to preach about tonight is intercessory prayer. That word intercession. Now, prayer in general is a very important part of the Christian life. We need to be praying. We need to be asking God. And the word pray literally means to ask. So when you pray to God, you're asking God for things. You're asking God for his help. You're asking him to do something for you. Now, an intercession is when you intercede on behalf of somebody else. When you ask for, for a, a benefit or for a prayer for somebody else, you're interceding for them. When someone wants you to kind of go in between them and God, or when you go between that person and God and you go directly to God to pray for them, you're interceding for them. And we see here that we ought to be interceding for people. We ought to be giving intercessions and praying for other people in this way. And um, now, just to help you understand this concept of intercession, Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He's the one that goes in between us and God for our salvation. The Bible says in verse number 5 here, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, the Bible says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. He's a mediator. He's the one who, who makes things right for us. See, God set forth His law. God set forth His judgment upon sinners. And when we break God's law, we deserve a punishment. We deserve hell. We deserve that great punishment. But because God loves us, Jesus came, he died on the cross and paid for our sins. He has become our mediator. He's the one that makes things right. We're the one that owes a debt to God and God demands that debt to be paid. So Jesus comes right in the middle and he says, okay, I'm going to mediate. I'm going to pay that debt for you and satisfy that punishment that needs to be paid from God. That's why he's our mediator. That's why he's our intercessor. He's the one who came and put himself in our place to pay for our sins. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse number 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Talking about Jesus Christ, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus Christ made that intercession for us. Turn, if you would, to um, 1 Samuel chapter 12. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read for you from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we see that even when we do pray, when we just make our own prayers unto God, we have the Holy Spirit that intercedes for us. So that when we pray, you know, oftentimes we don't necessarily word prayers the way that they should be worded. Sometimes we don't exactly pray for the right thing, but in our hearts we know what we want. And, and um, the Holy Spirit will intercede and will help to pray according to God's will. Because if we pray anything according to God's will, God promises to hear those prayers and he'll answer us. If we're walking in his, in his word, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we make a prayer according to God's will, hey, God's going to hear us. God's going to answer that prayer. But sometimes we don't always know how to pray according to God's will. Sometimes we pray for things that are a little bit off. Sometimes we don't know exactly, you know, when you pray for someone to be saved, obviously they need to make that choice. So the Holy Spirit can, can intercede and say, you know, and help us so that we're praying for things to happen where that person might get saved, where God would send a messenger to that person or other things. God, the Holy Spirit is kind of interceding and acting on our behalf and, and kind of rewording our prayers or translating what we really want unto God. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. He's saying we don't exactly know how we ought to be praying. We don't exactly know what to pray for. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He, he makes that the prayers that we want to have answered, He puts it in a, in a 
he makes those prayers in a way that's going to be in accordance to God's will for us and will we'll help those prayers then to be answered. If you're in 1 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to see here an example of what, you know, how we ought to be praying and interceding for other people. This is something that ought to be a part of our lives. We ought to be having other people in our minds and in our hearts and we should be focused on them so that we should be praying for them and interceding um, for, you know, to God on their behalf. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 19. We have a lot of scripture to look at. There's a lot of examples from in the Bible of people interceding for others. But in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19, the Bible reads, And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. So the people, now this is right after Samuel rebukes the, peop, the children of Israel because they had wanted a king. Now if you remember up to this time, it was a time of judges. God had judges in place to judge the land and to judge God's law. Abby, come sit up front right now. Sit in the front row right now. God gave us judges. He gave the, he gave the land of Israel judges to act, to, to judge God's law. God was supposed to be their king and the people of the land, the people of the land wanted a king for themselves. The people of the land said, no, we want to be like the heathen nations that are around about us and to get us a king. So Samuel rebukes them for that and he tells them, you know, this is how your king's going to be. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your children. He's going to do all these different things and you're basically going to be going into bondage because You've rejected God as being your king, and now you're going to have a man to be your king. So when they finally realize that they've, they've committed a sin, that they've done something that they shouldn't have been doing, they go to Samuel and they say, hey, Samuel, you know, pray for us. Pray for us that God doesn't just kill us because we've sinned. We've done wrong in doing in, in asking for a king. We realize now that we shouldn't have done that. So they're asking Samuel to pray for them. Say, please pray for us. You know, we've done wrong, but we're repenting. We know it's wrong and we want you to pray for us. Verse number 20, And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not. Ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside. For then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. So he's saying, you know, you've done this wickedness, you've done wrong. But don't depart from serving God now. Continue to serve Him and do what He wants you to do. And, and basically it'll be okay. Verse number 22 says, For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you His people. Verse number 23 is important. Look at this. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. So he's saying, look, it's a sin for me not to pray for you. And I believe we ought to keep that in mind. And remember, we ought to be praying for other people. He says, God forbid that I should sin and not pray for you. I will be praying for you, but he said, I'm also going to teach you the good in the right way. It's not just some prayer without any action, without him telling them what is good, what is the good way, what is the right way, what he ought to be doing or what they ought to be doing to be right with God. They need to learn that and understand that. Otherwise, his prayer is going to be fruitless. You can't pray for people to do the right thing if they don't even know what the right thing is. They need to be taught the right thing. Yet, he still is going to pray for God, for his mercy, for his long suffering. And at least he could go to God and say, hey, God, these people are trying to serve you. They're learning. They're growing. Their heart's in the right place. Lord, please give them some mercy. Please extend some long suffering unto them. But he follows all of that up with in verse 25. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed both ye and your king, no amount of prayer from a great man of God, even like Samuel, is going to do any good if they just decide to reject that, if they don't want to listen to what he's saying, if they don't want to receive what's being preached, and they just continue to do wickedly anyways. He said, hey, God's judgment's going to come upon you. And no amount of prayer is going to, is going to um, help for that. 
if they just completely reject what God teaches. But, you know, I wanted to show you that because we need to be praying for other people. Job is a great example of this. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 21. In Job chapter 1, we see what a, you know, Job was a great man. He was the greatest man on the earth at the time um, that, the, that those events in the book of Job take place. And he was a godly man. He was a righteous man. He had integrity. And he was also one that would pray and do things for his children. Uh, Job chapter 1, I'll read from you verse number 4 and 5. The Bible says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone, were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Continually, Job's children were on his mind. They were in his heart. He was thinking about them. He's thinking, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, one of my children have sinned and they've cursed God in their heart. And he says, you know what? Just in case, you know, I don't think that happened, but maybe it has. And just in case that happened, I'm going to intercede for them. I'm going to offer up some sacrifices unto God that God would be pleased, that God could be happy, that God could be long-suffering with them. And he says, you know, I love my children and I don't want them to do anything against God and I'm going to do my best to try to intercede for them and offer up some offerings and some sacrifices. Now, that type of viewpoint takes love. You have to love somebody in order to want good for them to be upon them or for God not to bring evil upon them. You have to have a love in your heart for that person. That's where this has to come. You need to make sure that your heart is right first with other people. That you're not just focused on yourself. That you're not just focused on, oh, what are all the bad things that are going on in my life? Now, if you have a lot of bad things going on in your life, you ought to be praying to God. Go to God. Ask Him for the help that you need. That's a prayer, but that's not an intercession. We ought to be doing both. You ought not to be so focused on your own life and your own struggles and your, and your own trials and troubles and tribulations and pains and everything else that you're going through that you're not thinking about other people. We need to be think, focused on other people the same way that we're focused on ourselves and, and we pray for our own problems. We need to be going and interceding for other people's. Moses was a perfect example of interceding for people. And I've got a lot of scripture to turn to. I don't know if we'll have time to get through all of it because there's so many examples in the Bible of Moses interceding for the children of Israel. And Moses gets between, he puts himself between God and the children of Israel and goes to God and pleads with God and says, God, please spare this people. They deserve the judgment they were going to get. They, they, were, they were sinning against God. And yet time and time again, Moses goes to God out of the love of his heart and the long suffering that he had for the people to just, to just go to God and, and beg God not to destroy him. Now, it's also not a coincidence that Moses was a very meek man. He was meek. He didn't lift himself up in pride. He didn't think that he was some great person. When God came to him and told him he's going to do all this stuff, he basically said to God, who am I? Who am I that I should go and lead this people? You know, I'm a nobody, God. I can't even speak. I need help. I can't do this. This is a great job. This is for someone you know, who's a great man. I'm not that great man. This is the, the way that Moses viewed himself. And we see all throughout Moses' ministry that he does fill his role, but at the same time, you know, people come up and, and they try to say, oh, you know, who is this Moses? You know, God speaks to us just as much as he speaks to you. And Moses never lifts himself up and says, no way, you know, like, Look, I'm the one in power. I'm the one in charge here. He's meek and he's humble and he goes to the Lord and he knows that he's the one in charge, but he's very humble. He never lifts himself up. He never responds with a prideful or haughty attitude. And I think you know, this definitely goes hand in hand with how much he cares about other people and how, how much he, he views their, the importance that they have over his own importance. He doesn't think he's better than anybody else. Numbers 21, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? 
For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So, get the story here. These people start complaining. They start complaining about their food. They're saying, oh, why did you bring us out in the wilderness just to die here? Why, you know, what, it was better that we would have just stayed in Egypt. And they, they start complaining about the bread that God had provided for them. They start complaining about the blessings that God has given them. And God gets angry and he sends serpents. He sends snakes to go and bite them. And they start dying and, and, and being killed. And it says they, they spake against God and against Moses. They're speaking against God. They're speaking against Moses. Yet look what happens. It says in verse number seven, after, now after they're in trouble, right? Verse number seven says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now, one thing that's important to note here is that this is very similar to the story in the New Testament where they asked Jesus how often Shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Right? He says, Shall up till seven times? And Jesus answered him, Not until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Basically, if, if your brother is sinning against you and then they turn and they repent and they change and they say, You know what? No, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I've done wrong. You basically just keep on forgiving him. Now, the people of the children of Israel, they continually did bad things. They continually. We're, we're speaking against God. It's like they would go a little while and then they'd start complaining again and then they'd start backsliding and then they'd start getting into wickedness. And it would take oftentimes something like these snakes to come in to get them back straight again. But you notice here, when they asked Moses to pray unto the Lord, he did it. Why did he do it? Because they came to him and said, look, we've sinned. We've spoken against Lord. We know what we've done is wrong. Please pray for us. Please pray that God will spare us. And Moses does so. Now, it would have been easy for Moses to say, oh, you guys were speaking against me. I'm not going to pray for you. But is that the, Mo the attitude that Moses had? No, he had a good attitude. Even though they were doing wicked, they were doing wrong. Hey, they repented. They realized what they were doing was wrong. So Moses said, I'll pray for you. And he does. And then what's also important to know is that when Moses prays for, for these people, God listens to him. It's not just a meaningless prayer. God actually listens and he changes his mind and stops doing those things and, and will, will not bring his judgment down upon people. Look at Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to try to hurry up through these examples because there's so many of them. I want to get to all of them because there's so much to comprehend about this intercessory prayers that, that we need to understand. Exodus 32, we see another story. Look at verse number 7 of Exodus 32. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may, wa may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. This is when Moses went up into the mount, and God's given him the Ten Commandments. And, of course, the people, they're like, oh, we don't know what happened to Moses. And they're like, make us gods. So Aaron makes them the molten calf, and they start worshiping the, the, the golden calf, and just getting into all kinds of wickedness and sin. And God's here speaking to Moses saying, okay, look, they've sinned and just let me be Moses because I'm going to destroy them. And he also even, he even ups it and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Because of course, God's going to keep his promise. He's going to keep his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's going to keep his promises to Moses. And he said, hey, you know what? I'm going to start all over with you. Now, Moses had to deal with a lot, even up to this point, with the children of Israel, with leading them about and he knew what type of people they were. He could have just been like, you know what, God? Yeah, I'm going to throw in the towel on these people. Forget about them. Wipe them out, God. And it would have been righteous for God to do that. God wouldn't have even suggested that he was going to do that if it wasn't going to be righteous. Because they sinned so much against him. 
But look what Moses does. It says in verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why did thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self. And said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses had a big impact, and these people, the children of Israel, probably had no idea how close they all were to destruction. God was ready to wipe them all out, wipe them off of the face of the earth, and to start all over with Moses. But Moses had that loving heart and, and that, that heart where he had compassion on the people, and he pleads with God. And he's like, God, look, you know, and, and he comes up with a way to, to, to satisfy God to say, you know, if you, if you kill these people, then the Egyptians are going to bring, you know, it's going to bring a bad name upon your name because they're going to say, oh, he just brought them out in the wilderness to kill them. And, um, you know, Moses intercedes for the people and it works. And the Bible says the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now, just as a side note, it's important to note here, God doing evil against his people means he was going to bring harm to them because they were going to die. It does not mean that God sinned. Doing evil isn't always a sin. Evil just means bringing harm upon others in the Bible's definition. And the Bible says here that Lord repented. Now, just because the word repent is there doesn't mean he repented of any sins. God doesn't sin. God doesn't need to turn from any sins. What did God do? He repented. What did he repent of? He repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. God changed his mind. That's how God repented. And that's what that word means. It's a change of mind. It's a changing or turning. So when you repent for salvation, you're changing your mind about what you used to think you needed to do to go to heaven and be saved, which is typically be a good person and do the right things and put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the repentance that needs to take place for salvation. Let's jump down in Exodus 32 to verse number 28. Verse number 28 of Exodus 32 says, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Now there was still a consequence for their sin, for making the golden calf and everything else. There, there was a, a penalty to be paid, but God didn't wipe them all out. A lot of people died that day and they had to make a stand and decide, are you going to serve the Lord or not? And the children of Levi came and they, and they said, you know what? We're for the Lord. And, um, but they, so there was still this punishment to be paid. And now we see here Moses saying, look, you've sinned. And this is a big deal. This isn't just some minor sin. You've sinned a great sin. And now I'm going to go up to the Lord and see if, if I can make an atonement for you and make it right with God. Verse number 31, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. And listen, this is, this is a, a very moving statement that he makes and it shows how much love he has for this people. This people have despised and rejected him in many cases in the past. Look at how he speaks. Verse number 32, he says, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. He doesn't even finish his sentence. He kind of stops halfway through his thought. He says, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. He's saying, God, I want you to spare this people so much that if you won't do it, God, just, just send me to hell. He's like, it's like he's offering up himself similar to the way that Jesus Christ did for us. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, his soul went to hell. 
and he was dead for those three days and three nights and he paid for our sins with the ultimate sacrifice. We see that, that heart of Moses who was willing to completely give himself over to even give up his inheritance of eternal life for God to spare these people. That, that is the heart that Moses had in interceding for them. Do you have that kind of heart today? Do you have that kind of heart for anybody? Now, it's one thing to have that type of a heart for maybe a family member or a spouse or you know, a child of yours. Moses had this heart for an entire group of people. Not necessarily his family members. The entire group of people. The entire group of sinners. People who were rejecting God in some cases. People who were just definitely sinning against God, making these golden calves. Moses loved them so much to be willing to, to sacrifice his own salvation. Now, of course, God doesn't let him do that. You can't do that. That's not a deal you can make with God. But the Bible says in Exodus 32, verse 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. He's saying, look, sinners will get blocked out of my book, but you're not going to get blotted out. You already have eternal life. Verse number 34, Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Now, again, we see this, that God still punishes them. He still plagues the people. But he doesn't destroy them because what he had originally wanted to do was just wipe them all out and kill them. So they suffered a much lesser punishment because of Moses' intercession to, the, to God for the people. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 9. Deuteronomy chapter number 9. We're going to see some more of the long suffering of Moses how much he was able to suffer these people <clears throat> that would do things and say things against him, against God, and yet repeatedly he would still stand on their behalf. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Look at verse number 13 of Deuteronomy chapter 9. The Bible reads, Furthermore the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So again, we see this deal coming from God about him destroying the people, blotting out their name and, and just starting over with Moses and making a, a mightier nation and greater than they. Verse number 15, So I turned and came down from the mount and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my hands and break them before your eyes. So here, this is Moses recounting that story that we saw already in Exodus 32. Where, where Moses intercedes for them and you know, God gives them the Ten Commandments. And here's, he's recounting this story again and telling the children of Israel what happened. Verse number 18 says, And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Moses fasted from food and water for 40 days and 40 nights just for this, the children of Israel's sin. What are you willing to do to intercede for others? When other people sin against God, when other people are, are, are in the wrong and they need someone to intercede for them to God, what are you willing to do? Moses was willing to fast and mourn and get, you know, humble himself and, and just try and plead and beg with God to get God's attention so that he would stay his judgment on the children of Israel. So that he would would lessen that judgment. 
Verse number 19 says, For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. Look, Moses took the, th the, the, the thoughts of God seriously. Moses took the word of God seriously. When God said he's going to destroy someone, you better believe Moses believed that. Now these people, apparently they didn't have that proper fear of the Lord because they're, went, they're going and turning themselves unto other gods like every chance they get it seems. They don't have the proper fear. They don't have the proper faith in God's word. But Moses does. Does Moses knows that when God speaks something, hey, that's for real. This is really going to happen. So that's why he, was, he feared for the people. He knows the truth. They, they are ignorant maybe or they're willingly ignorant. They don't want to think about it. But Moses knows and he intercedes for him. He says, but the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. Verse number 20, And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. He says it wasn't even just the children of Israel. He was mad at Aaron too because Aaron's the one that made the golden calf. So Moses is like, look, I prayed for everybody. I prayed for Aaron. God listened to me. I prayed for you. God listened to me. And he's telling these people what he'd done for him. Verse number 21, And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it and ground it very small even until it was as small as dust, and I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount, and at Tabra, and at Massa, and at Kibroth Hadaba, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. And he's, he's listing off these places, Tabra, Massa, Kibroth Hadaba, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Again, we see Moses interceding, saying, look, you have been rebellious since the first day I've known you. You haven't believed God. You haven't followed his commandments. You haven't been listening to what he has to say. He says, ever since I knew you, that's the way you've been. Yet I still, again, for 40 days and 40 nights, I fasted, I prayed, and I begged God not to destroy you. Verse number 27. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Lest the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised, and because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. We've got a couple more examples from the Old Testament here of um, Moses and his intercessory prayers and his intercession for the people of Israel. And we can see the heart of Moses. We can see the attitude of Moses, the humbleness of Moses, and how much he cares about these other people. This is all, all think about the way that he deals with these situations. Think about the way the people acted and think about the way Moses acted because Moses is the, the, the model that we need to be looking to in these situations and how we ought to be behaving and how we ought to be acting and interceding. Sit up in front right now. Look at Numbers chapter 14, how we ought to be interceding for other people. Sit down. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 7. The Bible reads, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not." Verse number 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. 
And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Just to get you in context, because I don't think I told you what the context was before we got started in this chapter. This is when they sent out the spies to spy out the land that God had given them for an inheritance. And, and they were sent out and they bring back a good report and saying, hey, it's a land that floweth with milk and honey. Hey, everything's great. The only problem is that there's people here. You know, there's the giants that are there, but it's a goodly land. You know, everything looks great. And 10 of the spies brought back an evil report and, and, and discouraged the hearts of the people saying, oh yeah, there's no way we could do this. They've got chariots. You know, they're giants. We're like grasshoppers to them. There's no way we could defeat these people. But um, Caleb and Joshua said, no, we could do this. And they had a good report. But... The, um, the congregation listened to these other people to the point where they said, hey, we should stone these people with stones. Who are you talking about? He's talking about Moses. He's talking about Aaron. They're talking about their leader saying, you know what? You brought us. This is supposed to be the promised land. We can't even do this because they had no faith in God. And they want to kill them. They want to stone them with stones. Verse number 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. He's saying, look, how, how much more do I have to do? These people are provoking me. They're, they're pushing me and trying to get me angry because they won't believe me. It doesn't matter how many signs I do. It doesn't matter that they get water out of the rock. It doesn't matter that I'm feeding them bread from heaven. None of these things matter. They still don't believe me and they still are provoking me to anger. He's like, what more do I have to do? Verse number 12 says, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Again, we see God ready to just wipe them out. Now we know that God is merciful. We know that God is long suffering. And we see two times here that God's willing to just wipe them all out and destroy them and start over. But look what Moses does. Verse 13, and Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of, the la of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by day time in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, he's, he's, he's going to the God and just pressing him, I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth, third and fourth generation. So Moses is going to God and saying, look, remember as you've already said that you're long-suffering, that you've got great mercy, God, that you forgive iniquity and transgression. No means, you're not clearing the guilty, but you have long suffering and you're merciful, God. Remember what you said. Verse number 19, pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. He's asking for just more mercy and more forgiveness, saying, God, you have such great mercy. You have such great forgiveness. Lord, extend that mercy a little bit further for these people now. You've already forgiven them of so much. You've already brought them forth with a, with a mighty hand out of Egypt. God, don't give the heathen an opportunity to say that, that God's not capable of bringing them into this land, dear Lord. And, and, and these are the arguments that he's using. Verse number 20, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. And again, we see that power that is associated with us being able to intercede for other people. When you go to God, yes, you can make a difference. See, people like to believe in what they call the sovereignty of God and say, well, God's just going to do whatever he's going to want to do because if it's just the God's will, then it's automatically going to happen. And there's nothing you can 
can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. This is a Calvinistic, that evil doctrine that says, yo, God just picks and chooses who's going to be saved. So what's the point of even going out and witnessing the people and talking about the gospel of Christ because he just picks and chooses. That's false. We can make a difference. We can make a difference in other people's lives by preaching them the gospel, giving them the opportunity to get saved. And we can make the difference when we intercede for other people by praying for them, by praying for God's mercy on them. You see someone struggling with sin, pray that God will have mercy on them, especially when they're, they're repenting, they're trying to do what's right. Hey, ask God to take it easy on them and, so that they can um, continue in his word and continue to grow. New Christian, everybody needs this, but new Christians especially. And we see that in this congregation. There's a bunch of people whose faith is not very strong in the Lord. And they need this intercessor, intercessory prayer by Moses, who was very strong in faith with God. Very, he, he believed God's word and did according to what God told him all throughout the Old Testament. We see him doing these things. And um, we see here God responding in kind, saying, okay, because you prayed this, according to your word, I've pardoned them. Sometimes you pray and you might think that your words are just going out into the air. And you've heard it in the Bible say, you know, God promises you answer his prayer, but I don't see it. Don't have that lapse of faith. We need to understand that we pray for things knowing that we'll receive those things that we ask of him. God's word is pure. As much as you rely on God's word to be the truth and the truth for your salvation, believe this, that God will pardon people according to, like he did with according to Moses' word. Verse number 21, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Turn, if you would, to number 16. Number 16 is the last example in the Old Testament that I want to show you. Number 16, verse number 19. The Bible reads, And Korah gathered all the congregation against them. Talking about against Aaron and Moses and Miriam. He gathers all the congregation and pits them against Moses and Aaron. And he says, um, And he pits them against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Again, God's angry. Again, God is ready to consume them and to destroy this people of Israel. Verse number 22, And they fell upon their faces and says, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? So they're pleading for the entire congregation. Now, what's important to notice here, they're not, they're not entreating God for Korah. He sinned against God. Korah was a false prophet. Korah was pitting everybody against the right way, against Moses and Aaron. Verse number 23 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Now, before I go any further, I wanted to point out, which I forgot to point this out, in the last section we turned to, the whole congregation, they wanted to stone Moses and Aaron with stones, yet Moses still had the heart to intercede for them. What type of love does it take when someone is willing to kill you and they're willing to stone you and put you to death, yet you still intercede for them? and will pray for them that God won't destroy them, even though they are wishing your destruction upon you. Moses prayed that, that they would not be destroyed. And that is a very, very um, important aspect to understand. We're going to get to that here in a little bit, uh, where the New Testament talks about loving your enemies, because it's totally applicable in that sense. Um, but let's see what he does here with Dathan and Abiram, because... The whole congregation was pitted against them. And, and Moses intercedes for the congregation, but this is a point where he doesn't intercede for, for Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. He says, um, 
In verse number 27, so they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing in the earth, open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them. And they perished from among the congregation and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. We see here Moses prayed and again he interceded for the congregation and God listened to him. God hearkened unto that prayer but um, we also notice that, that Moses did not intercede for Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, these false prophets that were, that were trying to steer people away from God and away from following Moses and Aaron. And Moses has no problems praying unto God and saying, you know, okay, we're going to settle this right now. And if these men just die a normal death, it's okay, God hasn't sent me. But if God does something he's, that's never been done before, if the earth just opens up, and swallows these people alive, then you better know that God sent me to do this. And that's exactly what happens. These people go straight to hell alive. They go, they, they, obviously, they die on their way down, but God makes it so that the earth just swallows them up, everything that they have, and just completely annihilates them and destroys them from off the face of the earth. And that was even said according to the words of Moses. And that'll be the last point I get to on when do we, when do we pray for people and when do we not pray for them. But turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5 because we see these people are, are you know, continually, the congregation is against Moses, against Aaron. They're, they want them dead half the time. They're complaining against them. They're murmuring against them and they're saying, oh yeah, these people, let's out. we should get a new captain. Let's, let's kill these guys and let's go back into Egypt. That's one of the things they wanted to do. And they're constantly complaining. They're constantly murmuring. They're constantly you know, against them. And oftentimes they want them dead. Yet Moses still loves them and still intercedes for them. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse number 43. Because what we see with Moses is in his heart is this New Testament teaching of loving your enemies. Now, if someone wants you dead, I think it's fair enough to say that that's your enemy. It's the same thing that happened with David and Saul. King Saul wanted David dead. Saul was David's enemy in that sense. Yet, what did David do? He wouldn't lift up his hand against Saul. He wouldn't do it. He was going to say, you know what? I'm going to let God judge this. God will take care of it. God's protecting me. I'm not going to be a revenger. I'm not going to you know, take his life, even though he's going after my life. I'm going to extend mercy upon him. I'm going to be long-suffering towards him. And that's exactly the way Moses was. And that's exactly the way that we ought to be today with your enemies, with even people who hate you, especially people that hate you. Look at verse number 43 of Matthew chapter 5. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even pu the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not, do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So we see this admonition to love our enemies to do good to those that persecute you. Now, that may be counterintuitive. You might think, well, no, if they do me wrong, you know, forget them. I'm just going to shun them. I'm not going to do anything for them. I'm not going to love them. Well, is that the way that God was towards you? 
O sinner, O person that, that's broken God's commandments and broken God's laws. God has extended mercy unto us. We're the ones that have lied. We're the ones that have stolen. We're the ones that have broken God's commandments and we deserve the punishment of hell. But God has extended mercy and long suffering unto us and didn't just say, well, fine, then just go to hell. He loved us enough to send Jesus Christ to die and pay for our sins. We were enemies of God, but we're made nigh, we're brought closer to him through the blood of Christ. And that's only because he loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Now, with that same mindset, with that Christ-like attitude, we ought to have that type of an attitude towards our enemies. There are people that hate you in this world. There are people that may even want you dead. There are people that have it out for you. And if they're your enemy for whatever reason that is, they don't like you, we're commanded we ought to love that person. Look at Romans chapter 12. And this, this will maybe give you a little bit more comfort in, in doing that as well, in loving your enemies. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 16. Romans 12. The Bible says in verse number 16 of Romans 12, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. He's saying, you don't need to take revenge on someone. When someone does you wrong, hey, don't revenge yourself. Don't avenge yourself. Give place unto wrath. Put your wrath aside. He says, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Don't take revenge on someone else when they do you wrong, when your enemy is out to hurt you. You're saying, that belongs to God. And you ought to have the understanding that God will take care of things. You don't have to see it. You ought not to be glorying over it, but just know that God will right every wrong that's done against you and that it's not your job to make things right. You need to overcome evil with good. Look at verse number 20. He says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. So, you know, the person that hates you, that person that wants you dead, hey, if you find them and they're hungering, give them some food. Help them out. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, listen to this, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. There's that much more judgment that when God makes things right, when someone hates you and you're doing what's right according to God's word and you're being nice to them and you're helping them out and they're still attacking you, you know what you're doing? That makes God that much more angry against them for treating you wrongly for trying to seek your hurt, for trying to set a snare or a trap for you to fall in, that makes God really angry because he sees, hey, not only has this person not done anything against you, but they're even being good to you. God will avenge that. So the, the nicer you are, the nicer you are, the more that's going to be just heaping coals of fire on their head. In verse number 23, 21, excuse me, sums it up. He says, be not overcome of evil. Don't let evil overcome you. He says, but overcome evil with good. You just be good. Hey, when someone's being rotten and nasty against you, you don't have to avenge it. You don't, you don't have to, you know, follow and, and, and do the same thing that they do against you. You don't have to revenge yourself. Overcome evil with good. When someone does bad to you, you do good unto them. Now, real quickly, I want to wrap this up. I don't have very much time. But we saw where Moses in that last, um, the last example that we looked at, he didn't pray for, for Dathan and Abiram. He didn't, he didn't pray for Korah. He didn't intercede for them. He allowed them to be swallowed up into the pit because that's what they deserved because they were false prophets. Because... They weren't just his enemies. They were the enemies of God. And this is what a lot of people these days, I think, have a hard time grasping or understanding is this concept of, you know, of hating and, and all this other stuff. We see in the Psalms, you know, David said, you know, do not I hate them that hate thee, O Lord. I hate them with a perfect hatred. And at the same time, we see David 
loving Saul and not doing anything against him when Saul was his enemy. But the difference was Saul wasn't God's enemy. Saul was David's enemy. Saul wasn't some reprobate. He was appointed by God to be the king and David recognized that and he didn't lift his hand against him and he let God be the avenger of such. But David also said, though, there's those that hate the Lord. There's reprobates of these false prophets that hate God. Those are the people that, yeah, you know what? We're going to hate those people because they hate God. It's not, you know, someone can hate me all day long. It doesn't mean I'm going to hate them back. I'm going to love my enemies if they're my enemies. But people that hate God, that's where we see a difference. Jeremiah chapter 7, we're going to see here where there is an instruction not to pray for people, not to intercede for them. So it's not intercession at all times for all people, no matter what. Jeremiah chapter 7 and 1 John chapter 5 are the last two places we're going to look at tonight that will explain when we ought not to be praying for people. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 8 says, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. He's talking to a people. And listen to these things that they're doing. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods? whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? He's saying, are you going to go out? You're going to steal. You're going to murder. You're going to kill. You're going to follow all these false gods. And then you're going to have the audacity to stand in the house of God and say, hey, we're delivered to do all these abominations. It's no big deal. We can just keep on doing this and just throw it up in God's face. Verse 11, is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Saying, you want a reminder of what happened before? Go look to Shiloh. Go look what happened before. Verse 13, And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but ye answered not. Again, these people, they've had opportunities. God has been trying to reach them. He said, I've been sending people. They're rising up early in the morning. I'm sending them out. They're preaching my word. They're trying to teach you. They're trying to instruct you. He says, but ye heard not. I called you, but you didn't answer Therefore, verse 14, will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all of your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Verse 16, therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer from them, for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Why? Because God has rejected them. When God has finally rejected someone, when he's, when he's reprobated them, when he's given them over, hey, it's too late. There's no point in trying to intercede for them. God's not going to hear you. 1 John chapter 5 is the last place we're going to turn. 1 John chapter number 5. Look at verse number 14 of 1 John chapter 5, right near the end of the Bible. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And again, this is, this is a, you know, in prayer, we have confidence. We have confidence with God. Hey, if we ask anything according to God's will, he's going to hear that. And that's what the Holy Spirit helps us to do to make our prayers according to his will. Verse number 15, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So we, if God's going to hear us, hey, we know that, he, that we're going to get what we're asking for. Verse 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So he's saying, you know, if you see your brother sin, and it's not a sin unto death, it's not a sin, you know, maybe where they become a reprobate, that's, that, that's just unto eternal damnation and death, then, yeah, pray for that person. If you say, there is a sin unto death, don't pray for that. Don't pray for that person. God's already given up on them. Then you don't have to pray for them. But, hey, when your brother sins, intercede for them. And this is the attitude. And this is what I want to close with. This is the attitude that we ought to have with other people in the church, with other people that you know in your life. Hey, you ought to be thinking about them. You ought to be praying for them. You ought to be interceding for them. You ought to be, you know, praying that God will be merciful and that they'll continue to do what's right and that, um, you know, especially when they've got a good heart and a good attitude and they're not just rejecting God's word, but they're being repentant. Hey, pray that the Lord will take it easy on them, especially when you know that people have sinned and they've done so many things that are wrong. Hey, if they come back, especially when people do wrong and maybe they get out of church and you know they've gotten into all kinds of sin and then they want to come back. Hey, pray that God will just take it easy on them. Intercede for them. And they recognize, especially when they recognize their sin. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much that you are so gracious and long-suffering and merciful, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please help us to have that same type of an attitude that Moses had, Lord, that Jesus Christ had for us. God, help us to remember um, all of these examples and that even when people wanted to go out and kill Moses, he still had a heart to, to pray for them and to plead with you and, and, and to humble himself and to fast for 40 days and 40 nights just for the people's sake, not for anything for his own benefit, but for their sake, dear God. Help us to have that type of a heart that we would, would try to get your attention and pray to you and take things so seriously especially when people who have no, no benefit whatsoever coming back to us, but that we would have that type of a heart to intercede and to pray for others, dear Lord. If we have this type of a heart, dear God, I know that we can do great things for your, your name and we can truly be ministers of your word, willing to serve others and having a mind and an attitude where we esteem others better than ourselves dear lord help this church to have that spirit and that mind in jesus name we pray amen